Oh God, it shall turn off my email now. <laughs> oh, email's off and the phone's off and, and the laundry's off. I shut my dryer off. <laughs> my dryer sings when it's done and I didn't want to have this singing, this ding oh, yeah. music. <laughs> yes, we got that sort of electronic kind of playing Mozart or something. I wish it played Mozart. <laughs> All right, well... Uh, <laughs> I see we've actually got a viewer. We've got diehards here. So I, it looks like we're we're definitely ready to rumble. Right, right, right. Uh, anyways, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our event, an event for Facebook Live for uh, the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. Flash mine. <laughs> yes. And this is actually our second event. So uh, not the second event for this book, but uh, we're, I think, number 17 for all the whole series all together. Mm -hmm. And I'm being joined here by Paul Willits in the UK. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I'm very well. Yeah. It's quite <laughs> a thing. <laughs> And we had a little bit of coordination problem. I've been emailing back and forth saying, I'm being directed to Safari browser. I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so why should anything go smoothly? Everyone who knows me knows that it never goes smoothly. So it's just like it's, you know, when you're with Mitzi, you're you're on the roller coaster ride. <laughs> I don't know where we're going, but we were definitely on a roller coaster. So I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Um, and uh, the book has just recently come out. I don't. Th I think it's coming out in the UK in about five days, right? The hard the, the print. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the ebook's out already, according to uh, Amazon UK. It looks like the ebook's up and running. But I, I, they're still they're still printing. They're still. <laughs> getting it done. I don't know. So uh, so Paul's here with us today, and uh, he wrote an a, a incredibly interesting story about art, murder, and Paris. And his story is called champs Lycée Noir. Um, and we thought Paul would sort of give us a little bit of an introduction by doing a short reading from your story. So um, do you have your pipes all oiled up and ready to go? Well, it's, a, it's a very short reading, but it's a, I hope it's a scene setter for what's a very strange story. We're obviously going to want to sort of tiptoe around potential spoilers because it goes off in strange directions. But here's, here's the opening. They'd been hired to kill a young man named Jean-Pierre Guillaume. Dressed in trench coats, the two assassins were waiting for him outside the entrance to the terminal at Paris Orly Airport on the misty evening of January the 27th, 1958. When Guillaume uh, eventually emerged from this giant, boxy modern building, he headed for the adjacent car park. He was a slender, dark-haired, not quite handsome 23-year-old who worked for Air France as a trainee airline steward. Watched by the two trench-coated men, Guillaume got into a black convertible which had white wall tyres. As it sped across the car park, the watching men ducked into their own car, then tailed him onto the northbound side of the A106, a broad road leading towards the low-rise heart of Paris. Despite the mist, they were able to keep tabs on Guillaume's distinctive vehicle. Just a few miles north of the airport, he stopped at one of the French capitals, many cafes famed for their zinc top bars and smoky allure. The men in the car behind him parked nearby. Intent on carrying out their plan, they followed Guillaume into the cafe. And so began perhaps the biggest French socio-political scandal since the Dreyfus affair more than 50 years earlier. And it, it was it's a very, very unpredictable story. I couldn't believe it hadn't been done to I death, really. It is. It's, it's, it is an amazing story. Um, and it does have it's like an octopus. There's just so many directions. But you, your, your uh, opening really does set up the uh, the atmosphere. And, and, and there is a lot of atmosphere fear. And, and by the title uh, with noir, you, yes. you could get that <laughs> noirish sort of uh, vibe going on. Oh, well, I'm glad, glad you felt so. It's uh, and it, I thought it I'm mean, going to comment in the piece that it's it's funny that it should have taken place at that point in the late 1950s when those French film critics at the magazine Cahiers du Cinema were, they coined the, the term, at least I'm pretty sure in saying that, they coined the term anyway, they were writing about what they identified as film noir and, and it was a real life one happening around them on those streets. 
Yes, yes, you sort of give us a, a, a literary noir sort of an atmosphere. Um, so as far as of this story, uh, so when is this taking place? Because I know we, we span a bit of time, but if you want to kind of give us an idea um, uh, where we start and where we end up, where, where all the key action happens. Well, the, 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 the present data, so to speak, in it is 1958-59. But it, the story actually has, in, in a rather noirish uh, tinge, well, one of many sort of noirish elements to it, it, it reaches back into the distant past. It's a case of, you know, a like Mitchum in Out of the Past. There's something that's lurking there and it's coming towards the present to, to shake things up. And the, the story has its roots a long time earlier in 1911 when when the man who under rather strange, I'm going to have to tiptoe around the sort of spoiler element, the man who under rather strange circumstances ends up lending his surname to the young airline steward who is being followed by the hitmen into the cafe who are about to do their deed. Um, the, the, the young airline steward's surname was given to him by a guy called Paul Guillaume and the story really has its roots in 1911, when Paul Guillaume was a, was a provincial Frenchman who drifted to Paris, or drifted is probably the wrong word, he purposely come to Paris to, to sample everything the big city could offer him. And he was, he was kind of unusual in that he was working in a car plant, car parts um, shop in Paris, and obviously, fairly early days of, of, of cars as a, as a sort of common phenomenon. And he's working in the shop, but he has a visual arts interests and he's got very vague literary interests. And he starts mixing in the world of the place to go then is Montmartre, not, not uh, Montparnasse, the left bank, as it later became the sort of epicenter of arty Paris, but it was Montmartre at that point. And he started mingling with the artists and poets of Montmartre. And he got to know a number of people, including um, Guillaume Apollinaire, the poet and, and sort of polemicist. And, um, Anyway, while, he's, while Paul Guillaume is working at this car parts place, when he's wandering around Montmartre on his way to a cafe, it's un, un, not documented quite the circumstances under which this happened, but he, he, come, he passes this laundry, just a common or garden Montmartre laundry, and displayed in the window is this something he's never seen before. It's this strange carving, and it's an African sculpture. And he starts, he just becomes obsessed by this sculpture. And he starts reading up about it. And it turns out to be a Sudanese piece of tribal sculpture. And he becomes utterly obsessed by that and the sculptures in general. And he starts making inquiries about them. And then he starts arranging for the car parts company's suppliers uh, who supply tires, rubber from French colonial West Africa. And he starts arranging for the shipping containers that are sent over to this garage with tires in them to be packed with just the spare bits of space with bits of tribal art and this he starts bringing this stuff in and he starts like taking his cue from the Montmartre laundry he starts exhibiting these things in the window presumably with arrangement with uh, the say so of the owner of the, the car parts place. And he's exhibiting these things in the window. And Guillaume Apollinaire, the poet, just because he sees these in the window, knowing his friend works there. And Guillaume Apollinaire brings this prominent Hungarian emigre art dealer to look at this stuff, just saying, This is amazing. And the art dealer starts spreading the word. And this then fuels this craze for you see in the work of people like Casso and Brack for uh, tribal art. And um, they start wanting to buy this stuff off Paul Guillaume, who's still working in the car parts uh, <laughs> shop. And they start giving him trading, giving him paintings in exchange for these um, sculptures. And he quickly, well, he quickly leaves the car parts place and sets up a dealership of his own, initially selling tribal art. But then he's built up such a collection of work by people like Picasso and Matisse and Andre Durand and Braque that um, 
he starts dealing in their work. And he, within nine years of that fateful walk past the uh, laundry, he's one of Paris's most prominent dealers in contemporary art. And that this is the, the unlikely route of these two hitmen in 1958 Paris. Well, yeah, I mean, that's it's so so we're talking about um, also, I mean, obviously, money plays a big part in mm -hmm. your story. Uh, this this collection that he he accumulates in the buying and the selling. We're talking really, really big money for art mm -hmm. here. And, and even in those times, and, yeah. and we get up to the 50s, it's still a lot of money. Oh, yeah, it's an enormous amount. I remember doing various calculations using uh, the economists who've set up sort of websites that give you rough approximates of, uh, of, of current value of past money. And, and you're talking about, God, I think it's, I can't remember the figures, but it's four or five billion. Of, actually, the, the, the money that just from the art, there's, there's other cash that gets involved. You're talking billions of dollars in 2021 terms. Yeah, that's saying <laughs> we all missed our, our, our calling there. We should have got into <laughs> yes. art. Right? <laughs> yes, it's, in, it's, a, it's a very opportune moment. <laughs> Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, the, before, sorry, I was just going to say, the guy is fascinating in his own right, just this sort of backstory, this scandal, because the bloke discovered a, a great gift for self-promotion and he starts, he sets up his own magazine and, and starts hosting all sorts of publicity stunts. And one of them, which sounded amazing, was much written about, was a sort of costume ball that he arranged to promote the gallery, hosted by Paul Poiret, the couturier and theatre designer, who do these extravagant theatre shows and sort of core, very sort of Busby Barclay, proto Busby Barclay kind of. Wow. Thing. Yeah, the, so so he was definitely somebody that um, uh, was held in a lot of esteem, and uh, <laughs> which we'll get into a bit later with uh, yeah. with his infamous wife. <laughs> yeah, and his <laughs> protege was the protege was was Modigliani, uh, the, the portrait painter, and Modigliani painted it as did a number of these artists. Modigliani did quite a well known portrait of him. As this, he's got this very purslit, tiny little moustache and a very purslit look with a little hat on. It's called. It, it's in the Orangery in Paris. It's called the New Helmsman. Uh, oh yes. Flattering yeah. to suggest this guy, this idea that would guide these young artists through the sort of choppy waters of the art world. Yeah, I love that. How you have that in there about that uh, description and that the the guiding through the choppy waters. I think that's just great. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if there's anyone or not too many people left like that, but um, uh, to, just to kind of, um, before we get into the story a bit and the characters who are involved in this story, um, what actually uh, brought you to write about this case? What, why was this so fascinating to you? What what hooked you in? Because I know that, I know the story behind it, but for yeah, it's, it's, others. Well, I'm sorry, the but I came across the story and then I immediately thought this was would be great material for a book. And it got touted around as a book, but it, I mean, it never got touted around to actual editors. It was always agents that felt it was too sort of dark. And that there, it's got to be said that there aren't, it's not a, a story that abounds with appealing characters. And uh, uh, so I can kind of see that point, but I still think it's a fascinating story. And I kind of came across it through an old edition of Life magazine. And one of the aspects of this story, which I thought had made it also very interesting, was that it became a worldwide story. It was a massive story in France, but you got newspapers in Texas covering it, newspapers in Australia. And it just was so, is so bizarre, the, the, the twists and turns it takes. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it, yeah, it was no surprise really that it surfaced in Life magazine. In fact, Life magazine predicted this was 1959 as the scandal was really getting going. Uh, Life magazine said there's only one thing for certain about this story, that one day it will become a movie. <laughs> so far, they haven't been proved right. <laughs> Bridget Bardot at one point was touted as, as the lead in a film, um, but nothing happened. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean that is a bit surprising, but you know, but who knows? You never know. Might happen, right? 
so no, actually, um, you you seem to have a, a, a you find sort of um, historical pieces, and I mean this is historical by today's terms. We're talking what seven seventy, you know, sixty some years ago. But um, I noticed with your other work as well, you like to. Um, pick from the past and write about the past. What, what is it about the past that appeals to you so much for your subject matter? Well, I, I mean, Joe P. Hartley, the novelist said it's a foreign country, but I increasingly find the present a foreign country, really. Uh, yeah. The past, actually the past, I, th I think not all that line about how strange the past is. I, I kind of have said this to people before, that I think it's, it's the present in, it's they're so it's so similar to the present in lots of ways that I think there's a tendency for people to think that the past is alien and that really if the costumes change, the technology changes, but human nature doesn't change. Yeah, uh, it gets worse. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, and um, yeah, so and, and I find the idea of um, trying to to catch some story that seems irrecoverable I, there's an element in me that likes a challenge really and that the, the fact that i can't go out and find generally in the stuff i've done there has, has have, there was an exception in the book that was within the more recent kind of memory but um generally i can't interview people about these stories so um uh, yeah, so you're restricted to sort of what you can find in archives, and it's it's a challenge to see what's around. And it, invariably, with crime, one of the reasons I think why there's so much historical true crime, is, or true crime in general, is that crimes, unlike most activities, probably other than politics and military action, are fantastically well documented. Um, so you can get an amazing amount of witness testimony about some murder that's long forgotten, whatever it is you've, you've battened onto. Uh, and I like that challenge of trying to fit the parts together, the material you've got, and to try and create something very immediate and actually to communicate via the writing that sense that this isn't alien, this is very immediate, and to try and, whether I succeed or not isn't for me to say, but to try and convey something very immediate about these stories. And then last yeah, well, there's also there's also a plus that if if it's farther enough back in the past, you won't <laughs> risk a lawsuit. <laughs> that, yes. That's a very comforting thought. <laughs> 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 like they're all dead, you know. Like yeah. I, there's actually one contributor in 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 this in in the book who um is a retired attorney. And when we were communicating about her story, that was the big thing on her mind, obviously, being a professional yeah. lawyer. But yeah. uh, she actually got some sort of insurance, some sort of a liability insurance. And I said, but the people have been dead for like a hundred years, but she still <laughs> wanted to cover herself. <laughs> she knows too much about her subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So I just like, well, I don't think you have to worry, but if you really want to get the insurance, go ahead and do it. It's up to you. <laughs> I just put disclaimer in the book and you know let's hope it's you know we're okay. Um so your your story itself um uh give us just I know we, we discussed uh mm -hmm. Uh, where it started, but give us a, a brief overview of of, of the case uh, without giving away all the spoilers. But um, how, where you know where we went from uh, how we got to the uh, the exciting stuff like trying to kill people and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the, the art collection becomes it 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 passes out of the hands of Paul Guillaume. He he gets to know in the twenties, very sort of Fitzgerald and all that. He goes to Riviera. I mean, not the murder elements or the sinister elements necessarily, or the overtly sinister bits. But he heads down to Nice to to holiday, by which time he's become a very wealthy man. And he, just as he's been fantastically fortunate, and he's obviously a gifted guy with a kind of eye to both the main chance and to interesting art of the period. But he, he's got less dis discernment, I think, about women and, and people's motives. And he meets this hatchet girl from a Paris nightclub on the Riviera. And he falls for her, very glamorous woman. And he, they marry. And she is the femme fatale to end all femme fatales. 
In fact, she'd probably kill the other fan for Charles. <laughs> uh, and, uh, she's at the heart of it, and, and she acquires his art collection, and she acquires other other. She's in, she becomes involved with a, a very very wealthy. The, the art collector dies under other suspicious circumstances, and I think it's really probable she was a serial killer. And she, he, she has a modus operandi that he, the art dealer art dealer dies art. in the same circumstances in which, her, or very similar circumstances in which her, her next husband, even wealthier, dies. So she has amassed this. She's in, the second husband is a guy who she, she reinvents herself. is very much a sort of Tom Ripley character. She comes from this rather impoverished background. And she changes her name, everything about her. She burns photos from her past. And so she creates this, this sort of fictional identity and then becomes a, a, a fixture within Parisian high society and is, is linked into Charles de Gaulle's government and it gets into really sort of high politics. Uh, and she's, yeah, she becomes involved with this. The second husband is so wealthy that only one aspect of his wealth accounts for something like something like ten percent of France's national income from abroad is his, uh, and she acquires this money. Wow! And, murdered, yeah. <laughs> and we we still have art as a key motivating factor, though yeah. here. Yeah. So she she wants to keep this art collection, and that is the motivation behind this this. The, the the assassination that's described at the beginning of the book, uh, and she's she's a woman who will stop at nothing. She, she when she in order to acquire her, her when her husband is on his deathbed, uh, well he has they, their relationship's really soured by the time he dies, and he, he's suffering from appendicitis, and she ensures that she's very late in ringing the doctor. <laughs> Put it that way. And this is something that's repeated again, and um, with another husband. And she uh, she finds that he's what is it? He has um, he's insisted that she will only inherit the art collection, which even at this stage we're talking early thirties is worth an enormous amount of money. She'll only inherit it if she has an heir who will then go on to inherit it in turn. And she is unable to have kids, so she does what any mad femme fatale would do. She finds a child trafficker and buys a baby, and she fakes a pregnancy for a while, and then goes off to supposedly have the baby, and she acquires this baby, who becomes her nominal son. But of course, once she's inherited the art collection, she doesn't want him. And she is a, an extraordinary monster, fascinating monster. Who was actually painted by one of um, uh, of Paul Guillaume's artist clients, uh, Andre Durand, did a painting painting of her called the the Woman in the Green Hat, and she's got he he became one of her many lovers. And he clearly discerned the kind of icy quality to her. She's both glamorous in the painting and monstrous. <laughs> I know you, you you really piqued my interest in this story to, to see that painting of her after actually knowing because I wonder how many people go uh, to and they view the painting and they don't realize the history behind who this woman is and what she did. Yes, it's funny to think because it's hanging with, I believe it's hanging, I can't quite remember, with other pictures in the collection and people looking at this collection would be unaware of this kind of dark story that's behind this public publicly displayed uh, beautiful collection of sort of early 20th century art. So you know what we need to do? We need when, when all this when the, when 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 we're a bit more normal again, if that ever happens, we need to go over there with a stack of these books, and we'll just set up right outside there and and say, all right, if you want to go in there, you know, buy a book, and we'll sign it, and then you'll understand what these paintings really are. Yes. <laughs> set up a it's table. Very, very <laughs> story, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this this um our femme fatale what what is the name she became known as 
Well, she becomes known as ultimately having married the second. She's a, she becomes Domenica, Domenica Guillaume, and then she becomes Domenica Valter, having married Jean Valter, who's this uh, very wealthy and, and apparently it seems incredibly nice. But again, a man he wasn't a good judge of women, at least. <laughs> Excuse me, and uh, he he. Married her, and she she inevitably acquired his name. Uh, so she becomes becomes even Domenica Valta, and the art collection later gets labelled the the the, the, the uh, Jean Domenica and Jean um, Valta art collection. I think that's the one. There, there are people with so many names. It's a, <laughs> yeah to keep up. <laughs> well, yeah, and in fact, as her name wasn't even Domenica in the first place, no, she just no, picked it out no. of the air. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose I've got it. Having written about the last book I wrote was about another of these kind of charlatans who, a guy who he was a, with, from a French Canadian background who grew up in Rhode Island, who, who re reinvented himself as, as a Native American and ultimately <laughs> the leader of the Cherokee, guy called Edgar Laplante. So I've clearly got some sort of fascination with these yeah. characters. Well, you mentioned you mentioned the the Tom Ripley character, and that I hadn't even put that together with with uh, Domenico, but that's exactly what he did as well. He just reinvented himself and pushed himself into this society that he had he really was not his society. But um, you know, I'm reminded of that as well because he gets involved in art, doesn't he, in the later book or in the second, possibly third book? And uh, yeah, yeah. So there are connections. Well, they abound really the connections with him. As, as actually, that, that's Patricia Highsmith who wrote the Ripley books, right? Mm, mm. Yeah, I love her work. So I don't know what that says about me, if that's dark <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I it think is, she's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so um, just to just to kind of give a brief idea. So we, we have this um, this purchased baby. Mm. And obviously, when he grows into adulthood, this is when he's going to be a threat because he's yeah. in line to inherit the art. And Dominica's not giving up that art easily, is she? And he's being treated. It's there are shades of again another movie connection. There are shades of mommy dearest about it because he's <laughs> yes. treated appallingly. He's made although he's his parents are among the wealthiest in the world. Never mind France. He's made to sleep under the dining table. And, <laughs> You know, given a second hand clothes, and she tries to humiliate him by making him wear when his coat she'll let his clothes sort of wear so they become threadbare and he becomes embarrassed at school. And she gives him a hand me down, clearly, woman's coat, and uh, just he, he she's just appalling to him, and uh, he becomes something of a de delinquent and a kind of embarrassment to her, and uh, but, yeah. And I was going to say, but uh, well, her motivation, aside from the fact that she she obviously hated him because now she's stuck with this this baby that grew into an adult and is uh, threatening her art collection. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, treating him so appallingly, though, I mean, uh, I mean, what would she have hoped to gain by that? But what he's going to just go off somewhere and vanish, or uh, I think pop she just him, but, but she did she did really try and get him killed through because she. Uh, was obviously aware of the threat that he poses. And one of her ruses, one of these many sort of diabolical ruses was under French law, he, he could be disbarred from inheriting her, inheriting her possessions or the art collection. Um, if, if the adoption could be canceled and the adoption, <laughs> could, the adoption which was only, she only officially adopted him under pressure from her second husband. So that one, and that was quite late on. I think he was a teenager by the time he was actually adopted. He was just this strange kind of foundling at that stage. And um, once he'd been adopted, she could actually cut him out of, of inheritance by cancelling the adoption if he committed, some, under French law, if he committed some kind of crime. That, that would give her grounds to cancel the adoption. So mm -hmm. she tries to set him up for all sorts of things. And she pays the cool girl to say that he is he's a pimp living off her. <laughs> you know, for a very sweet maternal gestures. 
<laughs> and if I'm correct, she even set him up in the military. That so that what was that uh, that he that he was going to have misery when he was <laughs> over in was it Algeria? He ends up in the brutal civil war in Algeria. He's joined the paratroops just to, for a job and to get away, I think. And she then has a word with the head of the French army to say, <laughs> "Oh, please, could you put this?" He's my son, and instead, like any normal mother, under those circumstances, if you could pull her strings, the normal mother would say, keep him out of harm's way. She'd say, put him in the front line, make sure he's in danger, which, which he did, and uh, he survived. Oh, my God. Yeah, that you mentioned the mommy dearest. And when you were mentioning Domenica earlier, I was actually having a Joan Crawford image about being the, if there was a film that had been made in the past, Joan might have been a yes, perfect. She, uh, she got that kind of tough, those tough, good looks that Domenica had. Iron. Yes, <laughs> Iron going through the right. blood. She got that sort of Crawford look where the look when the looks had disappeared. It was just this very hard mask like face. But she, despite that, she seemed to have no trouble attracting men, did she? I suppose she had charm and glamour. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just the ruthlessness of kind of homing in on people. I suppose, again, like Ripley, where he, they, they both had a sort of sixth sense about people who could be useful to them, which is a very psychopathic trait. I know that the, there are many female psychopaths, apparently, but... Uh, uh, I would think she was one of them. Yeah, yeah. I suppose if uh, if uh, this would have happened more recently, and somebody would have brought brought in some forensic psychologist, they they would have probably mm. diagnosed her with being a psychopath. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just this ruthless um, determination to protect herself at all costs, and uh, and that's threaded through the story. Yeah, well, well, with the theme of the book being sort of well-mannered, uh, you know, people who are just um, not who you would normally expect to be a criminal or had some uh, mm. special, you know, means of which they were able to get away with it. Obviously, Domenica with her, with her, with her money, the art, um, her her persona, uh, and her contacts. I mean, you mentioned that uh, the the Gaul government was even yeah, yeah. tight with her. One of her friends was was the novelist. Uh, I think he might have won the Nobel Prize, and it might be wrong about that, Andre Malraux, and, uh, and he was at that point the Minister for Culture, and she was a great friend of his, and she pulls strings with him to get her off the hook in many ways. And she just, just, she just sails through all sorts of things. I mean, it's not just the husbands that appear to have been killed, she appears to have killed the... Uh, a friend of hers, an, in, an investor in uh, her husband's business, Margaret Biddle, who was the wife of the U.S. ambassador or the ex-wife of the U.S. ambassador to France. And again, she, well, one of the fascinating characters actually in this story is someone who's involved in the mysterious death of Margaret Biddle, who's one of Domenica's many boyfriends. <laughs> Fantastic character who some movie maker would have a lot of fun with called Maurice Lacour. Maurice Lacour is a kind of high society Dr. Feelgood who's dispensing <laughs> drugs and getting to high society women. And he gets her hooked on all sorts of stuff. And he's, uh, he claims to be, what was the phrase? One of his business sort of pitches was that he has them, that, that he understands the secret mysteries of Siberian shamanism. <laughs> just this world of fantastic kind of slightly kind of new age nonsense. Yeah, but, new age before we had new age. <laughs> yeah, old age. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so we have art, murder, Paris. We and we even have drugs thrown in. So it's a lot of drugs. <laughs> it's all happening in in this story. Oh my god! So, so uh, just a, so so La Caz, because this became known as the La Caz affair, correct? Yeah. And who was La Caz? La Caz was oh god among this forest of names. I know. <laughs> Where was I? You, you asked me. You, you need one of these maps on the wall. I was saying to someone last yeah. week that with the pins yeah. and all. Because you need to sort of police it like some sort of police movie with photos and, and <laughs> arrows. <laughs> yeah. um, 
But uh, yeah, her brother is, Dominica's brother is Jean Lacaz, and that is actually her original surname. And her brother becomes, she, the brother is another sort of provincial, provincial French person on the make who comes to Paris. And she introduces him to um, a second husband, and he becomes a senior manager within the second husband's business empire. And Jean Lacaz is as bad as she is, and he is involved in all these machinations, trying to set up a son. Oh my God! And and the son just just wrote uh, this this poor kid. So so he was in the store. We sort of refer to him as Polo. Polo was his nickname. Yeah, 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 yes. He's, he's, he's Polo Nero. And uh, yeah, yeah, poor bloke. I mean, he somehow came through it. <laughs> Uh, as a nice natured, very forgiving guy. I don't think yeah. there are many people who'd be prepared to, I mean, he was even prepared to forgive his mum for the appalling things she'd done to him. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, it is it is an incredible story. I mean, and there are just so many parts to it and so many characters, and, and uh, it's one of these stories that um, it... it, it if you you know, it just seems like it could. It's an it's like a novel. It's just so there's so many parts. But um, we don't want to give away too much. But um, <laughs> that's, it's, that's it's, the it's danger. Work out how to tell it because you don't know where with these complex things. Like I know or something like that. Where the hell do you start? Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I mean, uh, just even writing it, I can't even imagine it. And then to be able to do it in uh, what seven thousand some words that you did. So it's just there's so much there. I well, mean, it would be more of a problem actually with the book because when you're in, when you're doing something in uh, with that kind of those limitations of, um, in terms of word count, in some ways it does make you well, it does. No, not in some ways. You yeah. home in on the essentials. Uh, because there are so, yeah. many, so many cul-de-sacs you could go down with, with this particular story. Interesting yeah. cul-de-sacs, but cul-de-sacs nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an incredible story, um, and definitely uh, uh, everyone's got to read it and read the book. Um, uh, so, so we'll kind of go off on a little bit of a, a related subject. But um, uh, you are you've you've written several books that are true crime books, and um, yeah. so how do you approach true crime writing? Well, as, as I said, there's a lot of usually a lot of material about it. Uh, or about a specific crime. Uh, so, for instance, oh, uh, I, I mean, I'll take for an example, maybe an unusual one for me that was was semi-historical. There were people I could interview. In, I, I did a biography. It's it's really a life and times of someone who might not mean anything, or well, it probably means nothing to to American viewers or listeners. A guy called Paul Raymond. He was. Who became a billionaire, and he was a he, he was an entrepreneurial bloke who uh, went through this world of black marketeers after during the war, uh, during the Second World War, and he turned himself into this fantastically successful businessman, running. His, the initial thing was running in the fag end of variety shows in Britain, to vaudeville in America, of these touring shows. He was presenting, it, you couldn't call it striptease, but in England there was this strange rule where you could show nudes on stage, but provided they didn't move. <laughs> it was bizarre. So the, the most famous instance of this was this wartime theatre called the Windmill Theatre in London, in, on the fringe of Soho in central London. Then a very kind of cosmopolitan area, not, not anymore. And uh, the Windmill... <laughs> would attract masses of American servicemen or servicemen from all over the world would go to see these shows which involved women uh, posing on stage. But they, they to give it a, a kind of decorous, palatable, aesthetic quality, they would pretend to be famous bits of sculpture or nudes from paintings, and they'd be hidden at the back. Well, they weren't hidden, but they were right at the back of the stage. So. You'd have to, if you were a serviceman, you'd have to be really peer into this darkened <laughs> stage with a little bit of illumination of the nudes to see the people. And Raymond 
came out of that world and he started presenting these shows around the country. And he ended up, where it starts to become true crime, was he ended up um, setting up, uh, uh, it wasn't Britain's first, but it was Britain's most successful strip club, which features in the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour. And it became a fantastically sort of chic place to go. Visiting Hollywood stars would go there. It was a sort of nightclub and cabaret club with a striptease element. And he, in you know, Soho was so dominated by the, the London underworld that he had to make accommodations with the underworld. And I started to, to have to interview people. I was interviewing police, gangsters, and looking at files. And I put in freedom, a freedom of information request to the Metropolitan Police. And uh, I had a very odd experience. It was, it was, it was sort of freedom of information in a peculiar way because I was, I was given an hour and timed I was told to go to a particular building. I went to this building and they made these files available about, it was, I'm not quite sure why, because they released them not long afterwards. I'm not quite sure why this whole thing became so furtive. But I was, I was timed. I had a, sort of almost a stopwatch on me. While I sat in this room, wasn't allowed to photograph anything, and just sat in this room with this file with someone watching me across the table. And the file was about, it was a totally weird story about Paul Raymond had been approached by someone, it was on the surface, it was by the IRA, who at that stage were staging a bombing campaign in London. And the IRA had apparently, though nothing is what it was what it seemed, had approached Paul Raymond trying to get him to pay money to them. And uh, anyway, as this story unfolded, it turned out Paul Raymond was getting terrified. He was getting these calls and the calls were, it was one of these extraordinary things in, a tr in true crime research where you're suddenly taken there because there were phone taps that I had access to through these files. And Paul Raymond was having these calls from these, these Irish voiced people on the phone. They were really got <laughs> up saying, you know, I've not a good mimic, so I can't do the Irish accent, but they bring up and say, Mr. Ray, is this Mr. Ray? And you say, yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to blow up your club. We're going to set fire to it if you don't pay. And then oh, we're going to harm your wife and daughter, all this stuff. And eventually they arrange, the IRA supposedly, arrange to collect the money from poor owners by that stage become... Uh, an owner of West End theatres with presenting shows with a kind of erotic element to so kind of farces, kind of sort of sex comedy farces, or a big thing at that time. And one of his theatres was the Whitehall Theatre in Whitehall in, in London. And um, the arrangement was made with all the police watching. The police were, were watching the theatre, and there were all sorts of police cars driving around, keeping tabs on this case because. Raymond was arranged for the IRA to be paid money from the Whitehall Theatre. And they said, we'll send someone around to collect this suitcase. It was a large sum of money. Anyway, this guy turns up at the theatre and says to Paul Raymond, you know, where's the money? And he, he goes and gets this suitcase, hands it over in the foyer. And the bloke isn't Irish. And there's something a bit odd about it. <laughs> he has to have an Irish accent to belong to the IRA, but he's not Irish. And he then, I mean, one of those sort of truth being weirder and funnier than fiction moments, he says to Paul Rome, who at the time, Paul Rome's very glam girlfriend, was appearing in this sex comedy farce called Pajama Top. It was a big hit in London, and that's on the White Wolf at the time of this pickup of the money. And this guy says to Paul Rome, he's, he takes this suitcase of money, which isn't actually money, it's the usual thing, you know, phone directories or something, with a layer of money on top. And he says to Paul, is there any chance of me having tickets for myself and my wife for Wednesday night's show? <laughs> God, this man is a total idiot. And uh, anyway, of course, he turns out to have nothing to do with the IRA. And this poor guy who just wanted a job as a decorator who dances an advert and gets involved with this rather manipulative uh, patron decorator who 
thinks he can extort money out of a prominent man. But it's just it's one of those things where you just think, yeah, this would be totally implausible in fiction. It's so ridiculous. And, uh, so, um, yeah, true crime can, the, 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 those sort of trials can throw up stuff that's, that's unexpectedly <laughs> cheery. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen that myself. It's, it's some of this stuff, if you were to write it as fiction, you would pretty much lose your audience because it would be so implausible, so ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> But yeah. it is. It isn't. It's. It's yeah. actually true. And. Uh, yeah. it but true. I mean, I think you. I think you have got a good argument there about writing about the past as as opposed to the present. When you, when you've got these sinister, uh, you know, threats being made and whatnot. So it's you know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know was, if anyone it, would be. It was a kind of me. world. I remember interviewing a lot of people. That, um, and actually, it was in the British Library once because doing the res some research for it because they happened to have some of his nightclub programs, and there was this fantastic moment where I went. They had three of these club programs, very glossy brochures from the sort of about the early seventies, I think it was. And I was I couldn't believe it when I went to the counter to collect them at the British Library. They, they said, you're going to have to go to the, it was just, I can't remember the label, but it's more or less the precious materials section. And I was given white gloves and a sort of cushion to rest this thing on, or these things. So I was sitting there next to a man who looked like he was reading a sort of Shakespeare folio and kept tying this 70s sort of soft core tat. <laughs> there was a sort of bubble above his head that clearly said, well, I wish I was reading that. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. Oh my goodness! Oh yeah, I was we probably think well, Shakespeare could get a bit saucy too. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, actually, I just thought of something with regard to your story, uh, Champs-Élysées Noir. Um, are any of the characters still alive? They are. Jean Pierre is. He is still alive. Yeah, and uh, I was wanting to interview him if a uh, book had gone ahead but it never did so I never interviewed him but he was living in America I know for a while uh, and uh, I couldn't sort of I could it was true at that stage I was doing sort of preparatory research and I traced him a, a certain way and then the sort of trail ran cold so I believe he's still alive I mean this may have changed but uh, uh, yeah and I think he he led a fulfilled life by all accounts and had a family and uh, and as I say, he sounded a nice guy and the poor bloke was saddled with this kind of monstrous family. <laughs> yeah, I don't so, blame you for changing continent. Yeah, yeah, again, far east has got New Zealand yeah. may have been a bit farther, but <laughs> <laughs> so Domenica's uh, she she's no longer around, no, I presume. She she isn't, no, no. Except for her painting. Yeah, the paintings and uh, and a great chunk of the collection is is in the we might as well say the gallery is in the orangery in, in Paris and that's that's only a fragment of the collection that you know, you know it's an amazing collection but uh, she was selling off quite a bit and she did her tastes were a bit more uh, sort of small c conservative than her first husband so a lot of the sort of more avant garde stuff of the early 20, 20th century. She got rid of by the time it made its way from her collection into the orangery. Oh, um, uh, well, it's certainly going to make me look at some of these paintings uh, a second chance, like the <laughs> world. <laughs> Uh, I, I know. I mean, it's. I mean, the, the the story is like a who's who of the art world. I mean, you know, really just incredible artists that are you know legendary artists. Yes, it's interesting. I love the actually love the picture of her first husband, the the one I mentioned, the, the, the helmsman, Carter, the new helmsman. The That's new helmsman. fascinating, and uh, yeah, very very sort of stylized and that kind of classic Medigliani sort of rather pointed little face, and yeah, just very sort of stylized, but conveying a lot of character within that. Well, people can actually find these paintings online. So if they if they want to see some of the uh, the uh, individuals in the story, they can see their paintings. Uh, um, Dominica's painting again is called what? If anyone wants to go and Google it, Lady in the Green Hat. No, you'd have to put it in French. I won't subject you to my uh, poor French pronunciation. 
Yeah, I do. I'm sort of skating away from that as well. And, and that was painted by Duran, Duran was it? Yeah, yeah, Andre Duran. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. D E R A I N. Yeah. Yeah, D yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's an easy one. That's an easy one. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, in, in closing, do you have any uh, anything exciting you're working on you'd like to mention? Uh, nothing really that's uh, advanced enough to actually start talking about. Okay, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had, you, the funny thing is, I mean, you, you, know, you probably had the same sort of thing where you, you find that sometimes stories you've come across in the past, I've just sort of filed them away, thinking that's interesting. For one reason or another, we'll dismiss them. And quite often, I'll go back to these files and think, "What on earth did I dismiss that?" You know, <laughs> oh, that's the extraordinary story. So maybe I should start yeah. digging around in those. Yeah, well, you know, so you could be off on a tangent with something else and working on something mm -hmm. else, and then things get shuffled in the background. That's Kind of like my that's my life. You know, it's like I can't finish anything because I got to get this other thing done. You know, true crime has sucked me into this big black hole. I can't get out of get out of it now. Oh dear. Well, I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Um, I've been speaking with Paul Willits, and his story is Chanson Lycée Noir, and it is in the best new true crime stories: well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. And Paul, thank you so much for coming on. And we got through our tech glitches and hooked up finally. <laughs> Thanks. I've enjoyed the collection, actually. I've been dipping into it. I've read one or two. I loved uh, Dean uh, Job's uh, piece about the yellow kid. That's yeah, cool. yeah. That's how we met. That's how we met. Yeah. Dean said, You need to talk to Paul. You know, maybe he's, That's you know, crazy. thinking perfect for the book. I'm like, Yes, I didn't know him Brad until he very kindly gave me a blurb for, um, or a puff, as we'd say in uh, Britain, for, for the last book I wrote at King Con about the, uh, the, the fake Cherokee. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's a terrific writer. Well, how I found Dean was he reviewed um, the book that came out before this, The Best New True Crime Story, Small Towns, and uh, he reviewed it for, um, was it Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine oh, yeah. for his yeah. column? And yeah. then he said, yeah, he says, are you doing any more books in this series? Because I'd be interested in writing. So it's like, now I think I've got Dean's in this one. Um, he's in, um, uh, I think he's, I've got him lined up for two more. <laughs> I'm losing track. <laughs> Catch him while you can, which is, his uh, new one doing very well. I know, I know he's really busy with that. I mean, I was hoping to get him onto this too. And he says, Oh my God, you know, his books just come out. And, you know, I'm like, Okay, okay, we'll see. Maybe later I could get you on here on Facebook Live. <laughs> so, well, thanks so much, Paul. It's been great chatting with you. Okay, thanks ever so much. <laughs> Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.